Thank you so much for having me. A real pleasure to be here. It was great to um, talk to many of you during the conference. It's a great start, inaugural year. Hopefully this keeps going. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about AI investments by firms and systematic risk. So the session is AI startups and risk. I'm in the AI and risk setup. It's not anything about startups in the stock, but lots of risk. So of course, there's been an explosion of investments in artificial intelligence from around 2012 onwards. So we're talking about tens of billions of dollars by established firms, similar figures in terms of new firms, and also a big push by governments in the US and Europe and Asia to invest more in artificial intelligence R&D. The reason that we've seen this explosion is that certain factors have been conducive to it, so data um, kind of accumulation by companies, but also decreasing computational costs have enabled newer methods that just in the past wouldn't perform as well um, on smaller amounts of data and with less computing power, um, and also some with technological advances. So those have been, I would say, not kind of the main contributors to the rise of AI investments. It's really been the computational side. Um, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? Well, in, in our research, my co-authors and I are pretty broad. We mean machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing. So all of that umbrella falls under artificial intelligence. And at the firm level, what do we already know happens to firms when firms invest in artificial intelligence? Because the first order of effect across all industries is that firms that invest more in artificial intelligence grow more. They're increasing their sales, actually increasing their employment. So yeah, it's not replacing jobs, so it's mainly firms hire more workers. And this growth seems to be happening through product innovation. Those firms are producing more new products, and as a result, they're able to sell more and capture more market share. There are some industries where we do see labor displacement. Those tend to be pretty specific industries, like audit, where there's not that much scope for product innovation, where the product itself is probably the closest artificial intelligence, right? It's all about prediction, anomaly detection to do a good audit. And so there we do see some efficiency gains, some labor displacement. But in most industries, we're seeing this booming growth. And there are also positive returns to AI investing firms. So those firms tend to outperform in terms of their returns relative to the market and relative to risk adjustments. What we don't know is what happens in the second moment? What happens to the risk and cost of capital of those firms? They're earning high returns, they're doing well. Are they riskier in some way? There are concerns about risks of AI, about how correlated right, AI might be making the market overall. So that's what we're looking at at this paper. We're exploring how AI investments by firms relate to changes in those firms' systematic risk. What do we expect to find? Well, at Sandy, we weren't sure which way it might go. The reason is to think that AI might increase systematic risk of firms, and the reason is to think that it might actually decrease systematic risk of firms. The reduction may be coming from better forecasting. Firms are using AI to better forecast demand. They might have less uncertainty about their future demand shocks, like tailor better, so they might become less risky. AI investing firms are also becoming larger, right? They're producing more. Larger firms tend to have lower beta, lower systematic risk component, at least in the past. So that might be another reason they become less risky. On the other hand, AI investments can also increase firm systematic risk by leading to a shared reliance on the same data sets and the same processes and the same algorithms that can make those firms more correlated. Right? So this would be an increased correlation among AI investing firms themselves with each other. We might have investor capital flowing into those firms, which again would induce more correlation among those firms with each other. Or we might also see an increase in systematic risk coming from growth options of those firms. Firms investing in AI are investing in product innovation. They may produce more in the future. That's an option right now. Options tend to be risky. They tend to be pro-cyclical. Right? Those options will pan out exactly when the market is doing well, not so much when the market is doing poorly. So that would also lead to a greater systematic risk. And that would lead to those firms correlating, not just with each other, but with the market as a whole. Spoiler alert, that's what we find. We find that AI investing firms are becoming more systematically risky. And what we think is going on is this growth options type mechanism. In our previous work, the same co-authors, Tanya Bajan of Columbia, Alex Hay, and Marilyn James Hudson, and the Foundation and I, we found that the main effect of AI has been to stimulate growth through product innovation. So those firms are innovating a lot. Product innovation is creating growth options. And in the past, we 
see that growth options are correlated with increased market betas, with increased systematic risk for those firms, because growth options are risky. And so as they kind of, the firms load up on those options more, those options become more in the money, the beta goes up. Eventually, once the options are realized, that's when the beta will come back down with systematic risk will decline. But I think for most firms, we're not necessarily at that stage yet. We're still pretty high on options. What are the predictions of this mechanism that we're not going to test in the data? Well, first of all, we should see increasing beta, increasing market risk component for firms that are investing in AI more due to this product innovation growth option channel. And as I mentioned, that is what we find. Second, AI investing firms are becoming more growth-like. So when you test whether they're correlated more with value firms or growth firms, what we should see is that they're becoming less correlated with value firms, more correlated with growth firms. That's what we're going to see in the data. Third, the beta increase should be especially pronounced for AI investing firms on the good side. They want market upswings rather than market downswings. <clears throat> when we decompose beta into the way that those firms co-move with the market on good versus bad times, we see a larger effect on the positive side. And then finally, and this is something that we're not yet able to test in our data, that we're looking forward to validating in the future, that eventually those AI investing first beta should drop as the growth is realized, as they're moving from the growth stage to the realization stage, once they've produced all of the products enabled by AI and not holding as many growth options, then it would see beta decline. How do we measure AI investments in the data for actual firms to be able to test these predictions in care? Well, what we do is we observe those firms' employees because AI implementation by firms requires three things. It requires data, requires computing power, and it requires the human capital to be able to leverage that computing power and that data to build the algorithms. Data is something that firms tend to accumulate over a long period of time. And you can purchase data, but that's not going to be proprietary or unique to you. It's going to be the same data that all the other firms are purchasing, which is not necessarily a comparative advantage. Computing power is something that has become cheaper. Now, of course, now we're using a lot more of it, so it's becoming expensive again, um, just based on the quantities. But in general, it became less of a limiting factor for firms, at least in that first decade of AI investments, the 2010s that we're looking at. Human capital is something that is very scarce. All firms are seeking to hire AI specialists. It's kind of hard to find them. We use two data sets to measure firms hiring of AI workers. One is actual hiring. These are employment profiles that come from a com company called Cognizum that aggregates company and employee information. We cover, by the end of the sample, we cover 64% of the total U.S. workforce. So we cover the vast majority of workers. So we're able to construct a pretty representative measure of firms' investments in AI. And we see all of their job histories, education, skills, patents, awards, whatever people put on their resumes. This captures actual hiring, not just firms looking to hire, but we do also use a more readily available data set from Bernie Glass, which are job postings. So this is what our firm is trying to hire. And in the paper, we show that the results are pretty similar using those two data sets. Today, I'm just going to show you the results with the first, but I think it's encouraging that they're similar using the second data set because the second data set is available for purchase for any researchers who might want to um, study similar things. How do we find people that we think are working in AI? Well, we start out with just the core concepts, AI, machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision. We look at all of the tens of thousands of required skills in the job postings data. For each one of them, we measure the co-occurrence of that skill with these core concepts. That gets us the most AI-related skills in right? deep learning. 86% of the time, a job that is going to mention deep learning will also mention machine learning or AI explicitly. By contrast, communication skills, vast majority of jobs requiring communication skills, I'm not going to say anything about AI. So we identify empirically the most AI-related terms, that way we don't need to pre-specify a dictionary ourselves. And then we search for those empirically most AI-related terms in the resumes. So if somebody's job title is a senior machine learning developer, that's an AI worker. If somebody's job title is more generic, just a software developer, but their job description is talking about TensorFlow, um, and deep learning, they're an AI worker. Or if they have a publication on neural networks, they're an AI worker. We do this for every employee in the resume data at every point in time. And then we aggregate it up to the firm level by looking at, for each firm in each year, what percentage of the overall workers of that firm got classified as being AI related. These percentages are very small. They're similar to the percentage of workers that are patent holding inventors. So these are 
very specialized workers that have an outsized influence on the firm. What do we measure as outcome? We're looking at beta. That's the co-movement of that stock's return with the overall market return. And we look at the difference in beta from the beginning of the sample in 2010 to the end of the sample in 2018. So this is early wave of beta. This is the 2010s sample. We look at beta just from a single factor model, just regressing the return in the market. We also look at beta from a four factor model where we also factor in um, three other factors, size, value, and momentum. It's the only results in either way. And then we control for a variety of firm level characteristics um, as well as commuting level characteristics. Our sample are all US public traded firm, non-tech firms. We're actually excluding tech firms from the sample because we're interested in understanding what happens as firms use AI, not as firms are producing AI solutions for others to use. So we exclude next sectors 51 and 54. And we also limit the sample to only those firms where we get to see enough employees in the resume data. If we only see 10 employees, there's no way we can calculate a meaningful rate right, measure of how many of them are AI workers. We get to see 100 employees, then more so. And here are the results. We see that firms that invest in AI more experience an increase in their market beta. They're becoming more correlated. Their returns are becoming more correlated with the market returns. This is ubiquitous across industries. They're becoming more correlated with their own industry, with the IT industry, and with other industries. So they're not just becoming more correlated with each other, they're becoming more correlated with everything. This is not the case for other technologies. When we, instead of looking at AI, look at IT or robotics, we don't see the same effect. When you look at R&D investment in general, and when you look at intangible and about, um, institutional capital, we don't see those results either. So this is specific to AI. We rule out a variety of alternative explanations that I don't have time to go into as I have only one minute left. So in that remaining one minute, what I want to show you are two additional pieces of evidence in favor of the growth options story. First of all, we look at how these firms correlate with the value versus growth factor. We find that indeed these firms are becoming, this is value over growth, they're becoming less heavy in value, they're becoming more heavy in growth. They're becoming growth firms consistent with their loading up growth options. And when we decompose this result into good versus bad market types, what we see is that the effect is twice or like three, two to three times larger on the upside than the downside, with this being a pretty significant difference. Those firms are co-moving with the market, but most of them are co-moving with the market more when the market is doing well on the upside, consistent with them loading up on positive growth opportunities to expand in these good market conditions. I'm going to skip that, and we're going to conclude by just saying that what we thought to, what we were setting out to do here was to offer a first investigation of how investments in artificial intelligence change not just firms' performance and returns, but also their risk profiles. And what we find is that firms that invest more in artificial intelligence become more systematically risky. They don't become more risky in the idiosyncratic part or overall. They're reallocating their risk towards the systematic component. And this seems to be due to those firms acquiring greater growth options, greater product innovation. So this risk concentrates on the upside. And these firms are becoming more growth-like firms because their growth options are, are penning out in good market conditions. So our findings suggest a novel implication market-wise for firms' investments in AI, that not only are they earning high positive returns, which we know from prior work, but that they're also becoming more correlated with the market upside specifically and with the market more general. So thank you very much and happy to take a couple of questions. Uh, is the denominator of percentage AI workers coming from CompuStat or coming from the Cognizant? So we've done it both ways, but the main specification is Cognizant. Okay. So that and accounts for, how, for not maybe some firms not having as good coverage as others. I see. And, it's, uh, and if you did with CompuStat, it's a very similar result. Yeah, and we also try weighting differently. So we do weigh observations by the number of employees so that we give greater emphasis to observations where we get to see people more. And again, same results if we do the weighting by Cognizant or Cognizant. They're, they are highly correlated. Those That's a great presentation. If you look at the heterogeneity of the effects here, um, for example, like if a financially strong 
firms have a high ROI probability, would they be this correlation of the finding would be stronger uh, or weaker? The reason is because the corporations, companies have higher, better financial resources and afford to looking more for these uh, AI workers. And that's why maybe they have more innovation as well and a higher risk. Yeah, great question. So in this paper, we don't look at that kind of heterogeneity, but in, in our earlier work, um, we both took a look at what predictive investments, and indeed cash-rich firms, firms that have more cash on hand, are able to invest in AI even quicker than firms that don't. Um, and we also see that the effects in terms of growth, so which firms are able to grow with AI, those tend to be higher in firms that are already large and that are already productive. So definitely the effects are not evenly distributed. The firms that are already big and productive tend to have more benefits in terms of operations. So I would presume that we would see the same thing here in terms of those firms would be the ones that are yet to acquire the most growth options with their AI investments. Thank you. Oh, one more question. Oh, sorry. Um, so this no change in the total return volatility is really interesting because I'm mean, just good higher sharp ratios for, you know, investing in these companies. Um, any speculation as to, like, if more information is getting released on some regular basis, why they don't have higher return volatility? Is it just too early for them to, for information to move the needle? Um, what's the intuition there? Yeah, that, that, that is a finding that we're kind of, I, I think our mechanism doesn't necessarily speak to, and I think we have a directional prediction there. We see a slight decline. I, I skipped over those slides um, because of the time constraint. We see a slight decline in the syncretic volatility of those firms. Not statistically significant at all specifications, but enough, I guess, that on aggregate, when we combine the systematic and the syncretic component, the total volatility stays roughly flat. So it seems like it's a reallocation of the risk profile from the idiosyncratic to the market systematic component. But again, that's not, that's kind of an additional set of findings rather than something that our mechanism would extend to predict. Well, thank you so much to the organizers. This has been a great conference so far. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a PhD student at Berkeley Haas, and I'm really excited to present to you today. This is joint work with Selene Delacorte and David Holtz, also at Berkeley Haas, and Rowan Clark and Rem Koning at HBS. Over the last 12 months, we've seen this surge of research on the impacts of generative AI. The focus of this research has been on the direct effects of AI on productivity and performance in developed countries. And this leaves open the risk that these new AI systems could negatively impact those people, places, and firms that are most in need of support. At the same time, there's this large body of evidence which suggests that firm performance business performance is constrained by access to high quality information and advice. And this is exactly the kind of content that these new AI systems could be able to provide at scale. Today I'll be presenting results from a five month long field experiment, which is looking at the effects of a GPT-4 powered AI business mentor that we designed to provide strategic advice to Kenyan micro entrepreneurs. The way this AI mentor works is entrepreneurs can text in with a question, and then if they're on this approved list of users, a couple of seconds later, they're going to receive three to five pieces of tailored strategic advice. And I wanna start by walking you through a couple of examples of real interactions that participants, these Kenyan micro entrepreneurs, had with this AI tool. So the first example is coming from this entrepreneur who has started a fast food business at a Matatu terminus. This is like a, a Kenyan bus station, essentially. And business was going okay for a couple of months, but then left and right, other fast food businesses started to pop up. And now this entrepreneur is getting very worried that, uh, that other businesses are going to outcompete their, their new enterprise. And so uh, he texts into the AI mentor and he says, look, how can, I, uh, how can I stay ahead of the rest of the pack, right? How can I keep my business uh, competitive in this changing environment? And here's the message, the response from the AI mentor that comes just a couple of seconds after the entrepreneur sends his question. It starts with a, a basic suggestion of differentiate your offerings, right? If you're selling product X and everybody else is selling product X, then you're going to be cost competing with all these other businesses. It's going to push your margins down. So diversify your offerings, right? 
This is kind of strategy 101 advice. And this might seem like obvious advice, but if you've spent time in emerging market contexts, you know that actually undifferentiated microenterprises are prolific, right? There are these similar businesses all over the place. They do, in fact, have very low margins. They have high rates of burn death. So this advice, differentiate your offerings, this is reasonable. And then the AI mentor also suggests you could think about offering programs to try to improve customer retention, right? A loyalty program, for example. You could think about partnering with local events, partnering with local organizations, a bunch of different options. From here, the entrepreneur can ask an entire new, a new question, a completely new question, or can enter a number, can text in and say, I'd like to learn more about one of these five options. And here we see the entrepreneur has said, this is interesting. Tell me more about option three, which is this customer loyalty program. And now uh, there are a bunch of different ways that you could implement a customer loyalty program, right? You could think about offering discounts for repeat customers. You could think about offering a birthday uh, discount, a birthday bonus to customers. You could think about incentivizing these uh, customers to provide feedback on how the business could be improved. So a bunch of different strategies now to improve or implement a customer loyalty program. And here's another example, a second example, a different Kenyan micro entrepreneur. This one texted in and she said, I've been running this car and motorcycle washing business. I'm honestly, I'm sick of running this business. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sick of washing cars every day. I'd like to hire an employee, but I'm concerned my business wasn't doing that well to begin with. If I hire an employee and they're a shirking employee, I'm paying them, they're not doing their job, this could push me into the red. So how can I think about trying to hire an employee and actually get them to do the work? And the first piece of advice here from the AI mentors is a basic one, right? If you want to hire someone, you need to know what you want that person to do. So this is write a clear job description, think about the tasks and the responsibilities of a prospective employee. And then conditional on hiring someone, you can think about trying to, uh, to monitor employee performance. You can think about trying to incentivize employee effort. And you can think about ways to efficiently provide uh, feedback to, to the employee. So a bunch of different suggestions, both in this example and in the last example. These are the start of much longer conversations that occur over, over weeks and months between the entrepreneurs and the AI mentor. And the way that this tool works is it's not telling the entrepreneur, do action A, do action B. Instead, it's generating a menu of options that the entrepreneur has to then exercise their judgment and choose which, if any, of these options are actually worth pursuing, right? Which of these things are, are worth doing? And also, the entrepreneur has to decide what questions to ask. So there's still this important role of entrepreneurial judgment and entrepreneurial choice when, uh, when interacting with and engaging with this, this AI tool. We evaluated this AI mentor in a five month long field experiment, which began with the insight that in, uh, in Kenya, there is extremely high Facebook adoption. This is uh, close to 100% among people under the age of 40. And so we ran ads on the meta ad platform, recruiting these micro enterprises. We end up with about 640 enterprises that are distributed all over Kenya. This is the a map of Kenya. They're coming from all over Kenya through these, these meta ads. And uh, we take these entrepreneurs, recruit them online, and then we track them for three months. And we build up this rich portfolio of information on uh, what these businesses do, right? What are the features of, of the, the kind of founder, the, the sole proprietor usually of, of these enterprises? Uh, what are their weekly and monthly profits and revenue? All of this information on these enterprises. And then after three months, we randomly assign these entrepreneurs into one of two different conditions. In the control condition, these entrepreneurs are given a standard business training guide that is freely available online. It's developed by the International Labor Organization. This is kind of like a generic guide how do you start and improve your business? It's not focused on any particular areas or sectors. It's a generic free guide. And we give people this guide over WhatsApp. We send them a WhatsApp message and we say, here's this guide. Use it if you want. 
Now we know from a lot of other work, if you just give entrepreneurs, students, whatever, a book, they're probably not going to read it and interact with it. So you can kind of think of this as a placebo control condition. And then in the treatment condition, the entrepreneurs are given unrestricted access to the AI business mentor. They can text in at any time of the day or night. They can ask as many questions as they want. Uh, WhatsApp has, uh, Kenya has the highest WhatsApp adoption of any country. It's like 99% WhatsApp adoption. So everybody is using WhatsApp. And unlike normal text messaging, SMS text messaging in Kenya, WhatsApp is completely free. So people can really engage with this tool as much as they want. They face, uh, they face essentially no barriers to, to using this tool. And then after randomly assigning entrepreneurs to receive the business training guides sent over WhatsApp or access to the AI mentor over WhatsApp, we track these entrepreneurs for an additional four time periods. And we are going to build up this index that will look at weekly and monthly profits and revenue. So this is kind of a, a composite index of, uh, of profits and revenue and, and, and more general business performance. We can split things up into these different components. All the results are, are the same, but a little bit noisier. So this figure is going to show you the causal effect of access to this AI tool, this GPT-4 powered AI business mentor on firm performance, on profits and revenue among these 640 Kenyan micro enterprises. Uh, the Y axis is the causal effect of access to AI. Positive values mean AI is leading to increases in profits and revenue. Negative values mean AI is leading to declines in profits and revenue. And before I show you these results, I want to remind you that basically every paper has found a positive effect of access to AI on, on productivity and performance. But we don't. We find essentially a, a null result. So here it's a 0 0.05 standard deviation effect. In this specification, it's slightly positive. In other pre-registered specifications, it's slightly negative. It's a null result. Underlying this null result is, I think, a really interesting and important heterogeneous effect. So I'm going to show you the results now, taking the entire sample of entrepreneurs, these 640 Kenyan micro-entrepreneurs, take the whole sample, and I'm going to split it up into two different groups. There's going to be what we're calling these initially low-performing entrepreneurs who are the entrepreneurs who are in the bottom half of the performance distribution pre-treatment. And then I'm going to show you the initially high-performing entrepreneurs who are in the top half of the performance distribution. And again, we're, we're splitting this up based on the pre-treatment values of, of profits and revenue. So if you look at these initially low-performing entrepreneurs, we actually see that Access to AI leads to declines in performance, right? This is a 0 0.09 standard deviation decrease in performance relative to control. So access to AI is leading these entrepreneurs to do worse than the control condition. And you can guess what's coming next from the average treatment effect here, right? Among those initially high-performing entrepreneurs who are in the top half of the distribution, there's a large increase in performance, a 0.19 standard deviation increase in performance. This is about a 15% a increase or improvement in profits and revenue. So we have null average treatment effect. We have a significant decline in performance among entrepreneurs who were not doing great to begin with. We have a big increase in performance among entrepreneurs who were doing well to begin with. It's a little bit noisier between uh, a little bit noisier among these initially high-performing entrepreneurs. Now, if you've run a field experiment before, you might be thinking about issues related to compliance. Maybe it's only the high performers who are actually using this tool. Maybe the low performers are getting some small benefit from that business training guide. Maybe they're just not using the tool. Actually, we see very similar patterns of, of use of interaction with the AI mentor. So this is the distribution of conversations with the AI mentor, the distributions look similar between low performers and high performers. The average number of interactions looks similar between low performers and high performers. So what's going on? Why do we see this, this performance decline among those entrepreneurs who are already not doing super well? I want to end with some insights from this incredibly rich text data we have. We have every single message that entrepreneurs sent to the AI mentor. We have all of the messages that 
the AI mentor sent back to the entrepreneurs. And what we see is that these initially low performing entrepreneurs are much more likely to be asking questions about how they can avoid competition, questions about how they can essentially keep their businesses afloat. And so here's an example, right? My business is close to closing. My challenge is low profitability and really slow sales. And we see this type of question over and over from those initially low performing entrepreneurs who are focused on these fundamentally more difficult and challenging tasks. What this means is that AI is going to have, I think, a really important impact on productivity and performance, but whether this impact is positive or negative is going to depend on the tasks that individuals and organizations select for AI assistance. Thank you and looking forward to your comments. whether they really understand the advice that the chatbot is giving? So that's something that I... Yeah, this is a, a great question. So um, prior to having access to the AI tool, they went through a training where they understood that the advice was coming from an AI tool, how to interact with it. And uh, we had these entrepreneurs rate the quality of the advice they were receiving. It's all rated as being very high quality and easy to understand. The people do seem to understand the advice. Yeah. Do you see any impact on the firm deaths? I'm wondering if there's like a kind of intensive extensive margin thing. Yeah, that, that's also a really good point. So like this could be in a sense a positive result if we see firms that were in a bad business being more likely to exit and maybe they go and they find something that they would be a better fit for. Um, we actually don't. So it's almost that we see firms who had like they're on a sinking ship and they're like doubling down trying to, you know, duct tape a big hole. <clears throat> So we, we, we don't see we don't see that, but we, we did look for that too. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the potential alternative effects of GNI? Like here using that for knowledge transfer, right? For training entrepreneur being better. But most of the studies you cited at the beginning are using that like just for, you know, replacing tasks that entrepreneurs were using, right? So writing emails, I don't know, and all this kind of stuff. Do you think that alternative use of GNI could be like could have actually an effect on performances or just I think so. I mean, there is lots of, so I think that one of the key things that differentiates, let me see if I have the table. One of the key things that differentiates this paper from, uh, from all of the other really great papers that have found positive effects on productivity and performance is that most of those papers take the form, I don't think it's in there. Most of those papers take the form, uh, here's a task. Some people get AI, some people don't. Here people are, having to choose what tasks to focus on. And I think that requires this additional level of, of judgment. And I think that it's, it's very likely that this is what's one of the things that's producing our, our negative effect. Yeah. What kind of data do you have on the firms that, that didn't, the low performers that didn't use? Uh, like, lots you of have data. no, okay, so, because I want to know about the mechanisms that allowed them not to die there. Is it that they were the only boss in the room? You know, like, what qualitatively? Yeah, so uh, <coughs> essentially we haven't found any clear mechanism. I think part of this is because, you know, as social scientists, we want one mechanism. Each of these firms, the power of AI is coming from the fact that they're each using it in a different, unique way. That's also made it harder for us to find consistent patterns in, in kind of use. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. I meant uh, firms that got your document and not the bot yeah. and did not die and were low performers. Uh, so could, it's good yeah. to this, like, should they have died or should they not? Um, yeah, that's it, interesting. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we, we, again, we also don't see clear changes and we have information on management practices. We tried to build in a bunch of things to allow us to answer this question. We didn't see any, any clear patterns. Cool. Yeah. I think a big theme of the conference today has been that AI boosts productivity pretty greatly across a lot of tasks. Uh, and today I want to present to you a paper that talks about a way in which increasing productivity in a task can also potentially create a new friction in information. So excited to present to you a new paper on whether AI basically cheapens talk with my wonderful co-authors, Bo Cowgill and Pablo Hernandez-Lagos. So like I said, 
Yesterday you heard Ethan Molly give a fantastic keynote presentation where he essentially talked about how you can do what once took like, I don't know, five days in like 57 seconds, right? Write an email, create an app all at once, basically. So one of the tasks in which AI and generative AI in particular can now help entrepreneurs and actually where prior field experiments, including uh, Ethan Fabrizio's and others that um, Ethan had mentioned yesterday, talked about is in writing persuasive material. So for example, a cover letter if you are a job candidate, a pitch if you're an entrepreneur trying to get investment. And notably, these types of persuasive materials are meant to signal the quality of kind of the underlying person, right, of the entrepreneur or of the job candidate. But if AI can basically make something seem more persuasive, basically make the signal look better without actually changing the underlying skill set or expertise of the person writing it, then actually it could potentially make this information not signal anything anymore. And so this really motivates the main research question that we're trying to address in the study, which is basically about whether generative AI uh, increases or reduces the informational value of signals, basically how it impacts this screening process. And so answering this is actually pretty difficult theoretically. And I'll show you why. So if we start with just kind of what the baseline is, what was the world like before ChatGPT? Well, in the entrepreneurship context, as I have often been in, this is a picture from a judging competition. I was one of the judges here. This is a Chilean entrepreneur basically pitching about a startup that is improving sustainability and agriculture. <coughs> For this entrepreneur to create a pretty compelling speech, a uh, pitch to get all of us judges to root for him, basically he had to have about I think it's like two or three decades of experience in aquaculture. His co-founders had two or three decades of experience in the marine industry. Like this guy knew his stuff and he was therefore able to make a pitch that was really compelling and got the judges fired up about him, including myself. But now, you know, fast forward a couple of years, we have generative AI, we have ChatGPT. We can just go on ChatGPT, type up, you know, please write me a compelling uh, pitch for improving sustainability in aquaculture. And here you go, ChatGPT4 can, can do it right for you. So in some sense, like the average person on the street can now come up with a compelling pitch without having to have decades of experience in a particular industry. Of course, then you might think, okay, maybe to actually write that prompt, you need some level of experience. Like it's not just gonna happen if you've never touched aquaculture, you've never touched the marine industry. And just to complicate things a little bit more, at some point, senders are going to anticipate that pretty much all investors, judges, for example, in this startup competition, are going to just expect that they're using ChatGPT. And so if senders expect that receivers, that investors are going to just kind of think that at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff is not really real and backed up by expertise, these entrepreneurs might be less likely to actually even put in effort in the first place, even when they're using something like ChatGPT. And so it's actually pretty theoretically tough and complex to think about what would actually happen. What would AI do to the informational value of these signals? And so to kind of put a little bit more structure around this problem and give us a bit more insight, we turn to first a theoretical model to help us basically put all of these moving parts together. So essentially in this model, we have Senders send signals to convince receivers. An entrepreneur, for example, write a pitch to convince investors to give them money. And we're gonna have kind of three components that are pretty important for impacting essentially the quality of the pitch. One is actual expertise of the sender. Two is basically how much AI boosts each sender, which can be very kind of individual and, and specific in some sense. And three is how much effort that sender actually puts in to make the pitch compelling. Importantly, all these three factors are privately known, so the sender kind of knows it, the receiver will not know it about the sender. And just to, I'm not going to go through the math, but just to um, assure you, we did a lot of math with my, my co-authors. This is my whiteboard, as it looks right now. I'm in the management division, but people come into my office and think I'm in the operations group. So, But I, I will save you from that for now. But a key parameter that comes out from this model is essentially whether non-experts benefit more from AI than experts in creating kind of the level, the quality of the pitch is pretty crucial. And 
If this happens within limits, essentially we have a few directional hypotheses. One is that generative AI is going to increase the average level of the signal, so kind of like the quality of the pitch. It will increase the variance of the signal. It will increase receivers' willingness to pay for a more costly signal. So think of it as like, rather than just relying on a pitch, also doing market research on a startup idea. And lastly, it will reduce the receiver's belief that the center is actually an expert after controlling for the actual kind of quality or level of the signal. So we're going to test these hypotheses in an experimental context. We're going to basically um, have a sender receiver design to match the model and kind of the problem at hand here, where essentially senders send pieces of persuasive text to receivers to try to convince them basically either giving them a job, as I'll show you in the hiring context, or to give them investment in the entrepreneurship context. We're going to do a two by two design. We're essentially going to randomize whether the um, sender is actually an expert in whatever they're writing the persuasive text in and whether they use ChatGPT. And then we'll have receivers essentially evaluate the pieces of text. We're gonna do it in two contexts, as I mentioned to you previously. One is entrepreneurship context. So essentially we're going to have entrepreneurs with experience in the education industry write a pitch for the education industry where they're an expert, write a pitch for the retail industry where they are not an expert, and for each of these two arms, use ChatGPT and not. We'll do the same thing in the hiring context. And we do this on Prolific, uh, where essentially, as Ethan mentioned yesterday, you might be concerned everyone is using ChatGPT. We did this a little bit earlier on before it became a big thing. But if anything, the fact that everyone can use ChatGPT at baseline would, if anything, downward bias our results. So um, if we pick up any effects, it would then be kind of a, a lower bound. And so just to give you a sense, so again, each um, sender is basically writing kind of four pitches, where they're an expert, where they are not, with ChatGPT, without ChatGPT. We then basically randomize showing um, these pitches that are written by experts versus not, and with ChatGPT and not, to receivers. We have each receiver evaluate eight pitches. And so we have about 806 receivers overall. Each evaluates eight pitches, about 6.5. 4K uh, observations in total. We show them when a pitch actually uses ChatGPT because we're really trying to measure the impact of ChatGPT as opposed to the uncertainty around ChatGPT for the receiver. And the receiver basically evaluates each pitch, giving basically what they, the probability that they believe this was actually written by an expert, their willingness to pay for a more costly signal, and then their kind of like general rating, you know, the quality around the pitch. And so overall, we see pretty high variance in ChatGPT's boost to the signal level, to the quality of the pitch. Part of this variation is actually coming from the country of the center, which we thought was pretty interesting. And so kind of given that variance within countries, one thing that we notice is that the key parameter in this study, which I mentioned, is basically how much, whether ChatGPT benefits experts more than non-experts in creating the level of the signal. This parameter at baseline is actually slightly negative, which means that non-experts slightly benefit more than experts. Well, what you see is actually quite a bit of variance based on the sender context. So essentially, senders in particular that are from non-English speaking contexts actually see kind of the opposite. Experts benefit more than non-experts. And we thought that was a pretty interesting baseline because it dovetails really nicely with actually what Nick was presenting before. Essentially, if we unpack this, what we find in our non-English speaking country pool, it's actually a result very similar to what Nick had shown you. Essentially, non-experts, if anything, see kind of like a negative effect on this particular task, which is writing a persuasive piece of text. Experts get quite a bit more benefit. In the English speaking context, we actually see the opposite. We see that non-experts benefit more than experts, uh, which is consistent with some of the studies done in kind of more developed context where you see that the bottom performers benefit more than the top performers. And so while this is um, not speaking yet to the informational signals, we thought this key parameter was really interesting because what it might be showing and what we think might be happening is that even within a given task, we can uncover the results that Nick, for example, found and also what other studies find with bottom performers benefiting more. This might be because of the distribution of the sample. So essentially, maybe you need kind of some threshold of expertise 
to get any benefit from ChatGPT. And then above that, essentially, there's some type of like a substitution effect where non-experts can actually benefit more than experts. And consistent with that logic, we actually find that if we kind of unpack the histogram of centers from non-English speaking contexts versus English speaking contexts, we find that there's kind of this um, uh, pretty much extended left tail for the non-English speaking context. So perhaps these non-experts essentially get no benefit from ChatGPT. If anything, they're hurt by them. And that's why you see this kind of complementary relationship in non-English speaking contexts and kind of this substitution relationship in English speaking ones. In terms of our other results, consistent with our hypotheses, we find that ChatGPT increases the level of the signal. You know, whether you include like pretty much every type of fixed effects from the sender, from the receiver, the order of the pitches, whether you use PBS lasso, whether we use rating that actually the receiver gave to the pitch versus a natural language processing uh, technique that evaluates the pitch quality. We find that ChatGPT also increases the variance of the signal, um, which basically kind of means it increases kind of the uncertainty around the rating for each um, pitch. And overall, we estimate that ChatGPT increases signal variance by 2 to 3% increases the receiver's demand to pay for a more costly signal. And interestingly, it actually reduces the receiver's belief that the pitch is written by an expert after you control for the level of the signal, whether you use the rating that the receiver gave or an NLP quality measure. And we find that the results attenuate in non-English speaking contexts, again, where you see that actually ChatGPT helps experts more. So just to conclude, we find that overall, basically, AI makes screening harder by increasing the noise in evaluations and increases, uh, basically reduces information transmission by about 2 to 3%. And really, a big contribution of this is to be really the first study to uh, both model and estimate the impact of AI on the informational quality of signals. Um, and really reveals also, going back to the last presentation, how global context can actually shape the distributional effects of AI. So with that, really excited for your questions, and thank you so much. Yeah. Was the poor performance of uh, the non-native English speakers who are not very good to be explained by, like, they didn't ask good prompts because they're not experts in their own area, and plus they're not native English speakers? Could it be, like, because they didn't ask good questions, that's why ChatGPT didn't give them good answers? Yeah, and I think that's part of it. I think, um, I think what I'm mentioning is like there might be some like threshold of capability for any given task that one needs to get any benefit from ChatGPT. Because this is about writing persuasive material, it's really about like communication abilities. And so, yes, if there's a big language friction, you might not um, be able to ask the right prompts. You might not be able to like, you might even fully understand essentially the, the, the persuasive text to be able to get any benefit. So yeah, I think that would be consistent. Uh, how about the people evaluating the answers because if you don't know enough to like understand the nuances and subtleties, maybe you can't differentiate a really good human response from an AI response because you don't have the expertise to like evaluate that startup in that specific sector. And on the receiver side, you mean? So we actually don't find um, as much heterogeneity with receivers. We did look for receivers that have some experience with investment, with, um, with actually hiring and supervising employees. Um, but I think um, I'd love to talk more maybe offline about kind of the heterogeneity you're thinking about. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, could you clarify if the results for entrepreneur, the, the entrepreneurship task versus the uh, hiring task were pooled in the results that you presented, or is it separate? Because you. Yeah, they are pooled together. We find similar results in the independent context as well. I see. And then yeah. in terms of the country matching, when you say non-English speaking country, is that like a whole set of random, not random, like a large range of non-English speaking countries? Or are we talking about like the Nordic countries versus Asia? Like which specific country are we talking about? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's pretty distributed across okay. um, several different countries. It's not like one specific region. Okay. Yeah. There's a related type question. I think it's about the global startup. Uh, implication. So I was thinking about how to interpret the English versus non-English, right? So let's say is it because the culture acceptance of the technology differently drive this explanation because you already have contrast results with English speaking and non-English speaking samples? Yeah, I'm not. I love to pick your brain on the cultural side. 
um, I, I think because of the nature of the task, which is like a persuasive, you know, writing persuasive text, it's about communication, um, we interpreted it a bit more as about um, the distribution of, of communication abilities in English, if that makes sense, which is what the task was. Maybe there's a cultural element, so maybe we can we chat more after the session about that. Thank you. Thank you.